What's going on everybody and welcome to a review slash overview of the new NVIDIA Jetson Nano dev kit. Now historically these dev kits have been on the more expensive side like $200 to $400 uh, or even more than that. Uh, but the Nano comes in at $99 which uh, I, in my opinion approaches more of the general hobbyist or the type of person who might be buying Raspberry Pis instead. And what you're getting for this $99 is pretty darn awesome. So first of all, what are we getting? So the biggest thing that we're getting here over say a Raspberry Pi is a 128 core Maxwell GPU. Also, you're getting a quad core ARM CPU. You've got four gigabytes of RAM, micro SD storage. You've got four USB 3.0 ports. You've got tons of GPIO here. You've got a, a CSI connector here for cameras. So something like the Raspberry Pi uh, camera. Also, you can just use USB cameras, of course. Uh, we've got gigabit internet. We've got HDMI, display port. You've got a five volt, four amp in here. You can also actually power this board via micro USB. Can't imagine why you'd buy this board uh, for anything that would allow you to use that low of power, but hey, it's there for you uh, if you have that use. <laughs> so first of all, um, you know this thing is called Nano. So I feel like I probably need to address the size of the board. So I have here not a Raspberry Pi 4, but it's the same size. It's a Raspberry Pi 3. So you can kind of see how these compare in size. Obviously, due to this heat sink, it's actually considerably, uh, <laughs> considerably taller. Although most people do wind up putting something on there. Um, their uh, processor there, but uh, you, you actually don't have to with a Pi. I'm gonna talk about that in a second here with the Nano. <laughs> um, so it's a considerably taller and it's about me, you know, it's less than double the size of a Pi, but it's, it's close to double the size of the Pi. But where it gets more interesting is comparing it to sizes of the old uh, board. So for example, this is a TK1, so a really old dev kit board, but you can see here it's considerably smaller than even this board, which was actually one of the smaller ones. And then in comparison, I don't have one, but uh, the TX1 and the TX2 I've just drawn out here. So here's our little baby Nano. <laughs> and then you've got your uh, TK1 and then the TX1 and 2 uh, sizes for comparison. So quite small, can definitely be used in a lot of applications because of it. So uh, let's talk briefly about heat. So traditionally with Raspberry Pis, I've kind of abused them. I don't really cool down the processor in any way. I never put fans or a little, I've seen people with the little heat sinks. It's cute, it's adorable, it's not necessary. I've used Raspberry Pis in very hot blistering conditions. Uh, they are really robust boards. Um, they're totally fine. But um, I will, I mean, okay. <laughs> I have killed my fair share of Raspberry Pis, don't get me wrong, but the Raspberry Pi is uh, a very hardy board. Now when it comes to the Nano, <laughs> I don't know if it's just because the GPU runs hotter or what, uh, even including this gigantic heatsink, um, you still have to have a fan, you just do, if, at least if you're using that GPU. Um, which is kind of odd because historically all of the dev kits, uh, this is the only one I have, but they've all come with fans. I'll put up some pictures if I remember to of the TX1 and TX2. But they have heat sinks, but then there's like a recessed fan in there. Um, I really wish they would have just done that to this board. I don't know if it's a cost savings thing or what, but... I strongly advise that you get some sort of extra cooling. So I'm thinking maybe some sort of water-based solution, you know, uh, no, okay, I'm just kidding. But definitely some sort of bigger heat sink or something like that. Okay, but seriously, you definitely want one of these like little fans or something like that that you can put on or a case that has a fan. You need to be moving air. If this thing is just sitting here, this heat sink heats up. Um, it get, it's like burning to the touch and uh, within about, uh, I would say it took about 15 minutes. I was running an object detection model and in about 15 minutes I front, the board just like turned off, the SD card got corrupted and I had to like remount the image and all that. It was, it was really fun. Uh, but this thing was super hot, like I, I, using a really advanced uh, temperature sensor called my thumb. Uh, it was too hot to the touch, which is generally um, a bad thing, for, especially when it's the heat sink that is hot to the touch, because this is distributing um, heat 
over this entire heatsink, which I promise you is not the size of your CPU or your GPU. So yeah, um, <laughs> um, big deal. Uh, be really careful about the heat and just buy a fan um, or use a case with a fan or whatever. All right, so now what I wanna do is just show you guys a quick example of doing object detection on this board. We are quite literally going to grab TensorFlow, put it on here, run the TensorFlow object detection API and see what we get. And then the other thing I'd like to do is show you guys one of the newer technologies from NVIDIA called TensorRT. And uh, when we get there, I'll explain a little bit more about it. So let's check it out. All right, as silly as I feel recording physically the monitor, <laughs> Uh, what we're looking to get here is an actual frame rate for the object detection model. And if I was using something like OBS to record the screen, uh, that would be skewing results considerably. So what you see here is straight TensorFlow GPU. We're running the TensorFlow object detection API and we're using the Inception V2 model. Uh, as you can see here, we're getting 1.3 frames per second with one object detected. Uh, the more objects that you detect, that's going to impact frame rate. So we definitely want to compare either with zero objects, which I think is kind of silly, or one object at least uh, or more. So for here, we're just going to compare with one object at a time. Anyway, you can see 1.3 frames per second. Now, most people would be like, well, okay, but shouldn't you be running TF Lite and not <laughs> regular full-blown TensorFlow on such a tiny device and that's probably true. So now let me go ahead and set up for TF Lite. Okay, and here we have the TF Lite example again using uh, the Inception V2 model. And what we have here in this case is somewhere between four and 4.1 frames per second. So a considerable improvement. I mean, you can see I'm just moving this pen around just for example of frame rate. I mean, that's not terrible. I should have done that under one frames per second, but at one frame per second, the problem is um, basically your reactions and the things that you're seeing could be delayed by all, an entire second, which is pretty, pretty hefty. So in this case, we're seeing four frames per second. So not too bad. That's borderline, dare I say, acceptable. Now let's show the Tensor RT version. So here we have the Tensor RT version of Inception V2. Uh, it's getting on average like 9.5 frames per second. It's fluctuating from the upper eights to even 10 frames a second. So I'm gonna call it 9.5 um, and that should be fair, I think. Uh, so compared that to say the uh, the TF Lite, it's about twice as fast. And then raw TensorFlow GPU, uh, it's like nine times faster. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so I'll just push this pen back and forth. So you can see, you know, I wouldn't want to play a game at this frames per second, but it's fairly reactive. So again, this is all done using TensorRT, which is an optimization that we can apply at the, like basically once we've got our frozen TensorFlow graph, we can use TensorRT to further optimize and hopefully speed up significantly inference, which basically that's when we're doing our predictions. So it's not gonna help us speed up training or anything like that, but in terms of actually using it in practice, it can be considerably faster uh, than what you might just get via just your vanilla output and dot predict. So really, really cool stuff. I hope to actually look into TensorRT much more in the future. Uh, so for example, with like the self-driving car in Grand Theft Auto, uh, the more frames per second we could get, the, the performance would increase like like considerably. Like if we could go from 30 frames a second to like 45, made a huge difference. So seeing improvements like this really excites me. So I definitely wanna look more into TensorRT uh, into the future, but also pretty cool to see it uh, helping out this little nano <laughs> to object detection. Uh, finally, doing object detection on the nano. I just chose Inception V2, it's a decent model. Uh, feel free to try a different model if you want. Uh, I, I definitely, this is not the quickest model to run on a small little device like this. So you can definitely get way better frames per second more. You can get for sure like 30 frames, 40 frames plus. Um, but this is an actually pretty accurate model that you're not gonna get either miss a lot of things or uh, get the wrong classification and stuff. Uh, questions, comments, concerns, whatever, feel free to leave them below. Come join us in the Discord. That's discord.gg slash Otherwise, I will see you in another video.
This video is brought to you in part by the following amazing channel members. Ridian Edwards, Mike Smith, AJ Shaney, Santanu Bowman, Kyle Gunby, the Dragon 573, Sir Sroka S all with us for a month now, as well as Kunal Magukhan. Ian Christensen, Visarad Kumar, YU, Michelle Berardi with us for two months. And finally, Dracodux, Umakanth Sakamar, three months. Thank you all very much for your support. It helps me put out awesome videos like this for awesome people like you.